So welcome in everybody. Um, my name is Lisa Hahn. I'm a professor of film and media studies here uh, at ASU and an affiliate of the Environmental Humanities Initiative. Um, so I'd like to start by introducing Joni Adamson, uh, the President's Professor of Environmental Humanities at ASU and lead of the Human uh, Sciences Focal Area of the Global Futures Laboratory. So Joni um, is going to start us off uh, with a few introductory remarks. Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, we are really excited to welcome you to the Ecologies and Infrastructures Cultural Techniques of Environmental Management Symposium. As Lisa said, I direct the Human Sciences Focal Area at the Global Futures Lab, which is now housed in the brand new uh, Rob and Melanie Walton Center for Planetary Futures. At ASU, we're quite proud that we are launching an effort that will focus on the ways in which we can ensure that both people and planet are thriving, thriving and surviving uh, into, the, into the future. And we're um, proud to, to focus uh, so much energy and resources on that effort. We're delighted that this in event is included in the over 40 events associated with the launch of this new planetary center for uh, uh, this new Center for Planetary Futures. And we are hosted, this event is being hosted by the Humanities for the Environment Global Observatories, the Human uh, Sciences Focal Area, the Department of English at ASU, and King's College London. And so we welcome you to this seminar. We look forward to the ways in which we can uh, support your work, ongoing work and projects. Um, and I would love to turn the time over to Lisa and Bernard. Thank you very much, Joni. Um, so, uh, I wanted to thank Joni, the, you know, the GFL, the Environmental Humanities Initiative, uh, and the ASU Department of English for helping us put this together. Um, thank you also to Bruce Matsunaga, who's going to be uh, helping us on the tech side today. Um, so I want to welcome everybody to the first KCL ASU Symposium on Ecologies and Infrastructures. And um, We'd like to start off uh, today just by offering some background on how this all came together. Um, so the first title of this symposium, and let me just uh, put my slide back up here um, so that you can all see ecologies and infrastructures. Uh, let's see. Oops. Sorry, one second. Um, the first title of this symposium, Ecologies and Infrastructures, um, comes out of our interest in thinking about um, the embedding of knowledge infrastructures, media infrastructures, and other kinds of infrastructure in the environment. Um, so critical infrastructure studies aims to take into account the material material basis of meaning making, uh, looking toward how physical arrangements and structures for knowledge mediate across space and time. So building on these concerns, our symposium highlights a specific interest in infrastructure and ecology. So you could interpret that in terms of ecological infrastructure or the greening of infrastructural design. Um, infrastructures can and do play a direct role in manifesting and sustaining life worlds. Borrowing a phrase from uh, Rafika Ruiz, we can frame this in terms of infrastructural mediation, the idea that infrastructures themselves articulate, transform, and communicate relationships between uh, people, uh, between uh, technologies, ideas, landscapes, and non-human life. However, the relationships of infrastructure to landscapes and to nature also escape the bounds of their intended uses. And so we can speak not only of ecological infrastructure, but also of infrastructural ecologies. So infrastructural ecology might attend instead to questions of emergence, uh, what grows around our environmental infrastructures beyond efforts to represent, um, contain, or stabilize meaning. So this gets us to one of the, the main guiding questions of this symposium. How might notions of infrastructure and ecology offer new paths forward for thinking about problems um, such as ethics, politics, justice, uh, and agencies in today's fragile environments? 
Um, so I think, for instance, of a study uh, of the Trans-African Highway by Kenny Coopers and Preeta Meyer about um, where they talk about how productions of waypoints end up symbolically and literally, literally destroying existing relationships between people and their lands. Um, and so that example reflects what I see a lot of scholars of infrastructure grappling with, um, which is this question of what gets lost or discarded in our quest for uh, frictionless exchange, for the longevity of systems, um, for efficiency, and, and for the experience of immediacy. Um, and, and also who gets excluded from those futures and prospects that these infrastructures are imagining. Um, so I'll turn it to uh, Bernard next for some context about the subtitle of the symposium, Cultural Techniques uh, of Environmental Management. So uh, thank you. Um, I, I just want to echo Lisa in thanking uh, Joni and our other hosts uh, for bringing us together today. Um, <clears throat> So just to put a little bit of context to our subtitle, which is as, as, as a suggestion as much as anything else, uh, we invoke the term uh, cultural techniques to grasp the historical specificity of environmental management today that's undertaken by ecologies and infrastructure. So we borrow this term from recent work in German media theory concerning how ensembles of technical practices shape collective life. I see Jeffrey Winthrop Young is here. Um, he's been one of the major people in, in promoting this, uh, this concept, particularly in the English-speaking world. So media theorists embrace this term partially to overcome a false opposition between human life uh, and uh, techniques. But the strange history of the term also points towards a wider retooling of fields like media theory and digital studies today. Now, across media studies, there's actually an extraordinary backdrop of something like environmental thinking, particularly in people like McLuhan and Innes, and of course, American comm studies with its long uh, association with things like uh, schools of agriculture. The German term cultural techniques in its 19th century origins designated originally something more like agricultural engineering. And it came from a moment in German history when new ecological notions from Friedrich Ratzel's infamous idea of Lebensraum to Fritz Haber's seminal process for fixing nitrate, the Haber process, emerged as a new way of understanding how you might artificially produce territories for life. These were technical territories, there were political territories with a peculiar, often disturbing intermingling of politics and life together. <clears throat> One reason that I think the German tradition has proven particularly instructive and useful is that, you know, it remains the case that in the Americas, to a certain extent, in uh, British and French traditions, um, a certain imperial notion of the frontier, of expansion, uh, actually militated thinking about the artificiality of environments and the ways that they're limited and contained. This was not so much the case in German speaking territories, which for historical reasons, for geographic reasons, laid much more emphasis, particularly in the 19th and early 20th century, on how it is that you manufacture and exploit enclosed technical spaces. Um, so with, with that, uh, you had the, the concept of cultural techniques emerge to describe agricultural engineering and a particular crisis with how to kind of reproduce the land and organize the land technically and how to mediate it. It seems to me elements of that have actually continued, uh, elements of the history continue to get unpacked in the German context today with people like Florian Sprenger and his recent work, for example, on uh, the national socialist context of Jakob von Uxkel's writings on ecology. The notion of ecology itself is a fully political concept, and it's also a notion of how a particular environment is produced and what its hierarchies are. You could think of Christiana Foss and Lawrence Engel's work on dioramas, and this is part of a larger backdrop of cultural techniques that I think is flourishing across media studies today, but particularly in the German context that is dealing with how it is that a space is produced and how it's invested, how our environments are actually managed and produced and shaped by politics, technology, religion, and other forces. So in subsequent decades, media theory has taken the term cultural techniques to explain how practices such as writing, arithmetic, architecture, and map making produce technically organized spaces for culture, including notably distinctions between one culture and another. And we're coming closer to Jeffrey Winthrop Young's, for example, discussions of the term. While building on that history, we want to kind of draw out this earlier history um, to 
partially grasp some of the troubling political history of what is at stake in environmental management. Environmental management uh, is not all, it's not all flowers. Uh, and also it's abiding a relationship with other technical practices that we're constantly confronting today in digital culture, in digital humanities, in literary studies, political science, and of course in engineering. So from that fraught history of a concept like cultural techniques, we come to grips with the notion that the, 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 the environment is finite, the earth is a cultural problem, and we have an alternative to the idea of endless frontiers. So this troubling uh, agricultural imagination seems, we thought in some ways, suited to the problems of the Anthropocene and the problems of environmental management today for thinking through its promise and thinking through its tremendous difficulties. <clears throat> With those histories in mind, so our symposium promotes a post-naturalistic environmental outlook untethered from the binaries of nature and culture to instead focus on infrastructure and engineering as agents in fashioning our ecological conditions. <clears throat> This post-apocalyptic outlook uh, is not only because a certain end of the environment has arrived, but simply because notions of beginning and continuity have kind of lost their coherency for explaining the world and the environment in which we live today. So instead, we're attending to relations and possibilities that point towards other expansive agendas for life, human, and otherwise in our increasingly technical world. So the format today is two panels. At the end of each panel, attendees will have the opportunity to ask uh, a question and answer chat. And um, following that, um, we'll start with one panel, then we'll jump to the other panel. Speaking first is Lisa Hahn. I suggest we jump straight into that. So Lisa, who you've already heard a little bit about and from, is Assistant Professor of Film and Media Studies in the Department of English at Arizona State University. Her research is situated at the intersections of environmental media studies, media infrastructure studies, and science and technology studies. She is currently working on a book entitled Deepwater Alchemy, Extracted Media, Mediation, and the Taming of the Seafloor, which examines how media operations in deep ocean environments pave the way for extractive industry. She's published uh, work on medical media, internet freedom, environmental media, in journals such as Configurations, Media and Environment, Communication, Culture and Critique, and Contraception. <clears throat> so here we have, uh, I, I hand over to Lisa Hahn to speak on Doctors at Sea, Medical Imaginaries of Ocean Observation and Management. Thank you so much for that intro, Bernard, and for those comments. Um, so I just uh, threw up this page right here with our schedule for today, um, but I'm going to go go ahead and get started on my talk. So uh, a bit of background about this work. Uh, I'm really interested in thinking about mediated ecosystems as consequential spaces, spaces for the study of environmental ideology um, and human relationships to the planet. So the bulk of my research, uh, as Bernard mentioned, is on the cultural history of deep sea mediation and sensing infrastructure. And one of the things that I've noticed throughout my research is this pattern of using medical analogies and imaginaries to describe marine research, um, either casting the ocean as the lungs of the planet uh, or its pumping heart. So from pacemakers to uh, ultrasounds and x-rays, um, medical references cast ocean, doc uh, ocean scientists as ocean doctors and the oceans as an ailing patient. So for me, this rhetoric exemplifies the notion of cultural technique as a technological a priori. So the institutional procedures, um, the environments, relations, habits, and ideas that coagulate into technological assemblages. Um, today, I wanna explore the cultural and epistemic assumptions behind um, some of these imaginaries. So how does medical language frame human relationships to our planet? And what are some of the affordances and limitations of using medical media as objects for thinking through environmental management? Um, I have three particular questions that I want to consider. Um, so the first is, is this question of how do these analogies mediate environmental issues across scale? Um, because the ocean is not a monolithic patient and ocean technologies are themselves comprised of um, a patchwork of interdisciplinary techniques. Um, comparisons to medicine are descriptive and also communicate the value of those technologies by articulating them to existing knowledge systems. 
The second piece of this, I think, requires some reflection on how medical language communicates particular anxieties about environmental risk. So Kirsten Oster talks about the phenomenon of inoculation by representation in medical imaging. Can we think of the media of environmental management in these terms? And if so, precisely what are we inoculating ourselves against? Um, and then the third uh, question or hypothesis that I posed here um, is the Foucauldian take. So both medical media and ocean observation express a similar set of um, political and economic conditions that are set by Western agendas, which have historically been subject to, you know, a certain kind of paternalistic desire to um, depoliticize and also dematerialize the work of uh, environmental observation. So does that emphasis on the authority of disciplinary expertise um, on technological solutions come at the expense of other kinds of knowledge and documentation? So next what I'm gonna do is um, examine these ideas through three medical figures, the pacemaker, the Fitbit, and the ultrasound. So I'll start with the pacemaker. Um, in Bogota, Colombia in the 1980s, there's a man named Jorge Reynolds who gained prestige by inventing the first battery powered external pacemaker. Later, Reynolds started wondering what would it take to produce an electrocardiogram of an Amazon river dolphin or a humpback whale. That journey put him into contact with some of the front runners in marine wildlife telemetry in the US, um, after which he created a research team called the Whale Heart Satellite Tracking Team or WIST team. In interviews, Reynolds remarked, I think I have contributed to the whale, not as a spectacle, but as a creature which lives for the benefit of mankind, um, which is an interesting statement that emphasizes both, you know, certain kind of anthropocentrism, um, as well as this poetic sense of kinship that Reynolds was feeling working with both whale hearts and human hearts. Today, um, marine tags have proliferated and include transmitting satellite tags uh, designed to answer larger scale and long-term questions about marine habitats. Um, so I have an example here, Icarus, uh, which uses the Argos satellite system for tracking tagged animals. Um, and they talk about how their network of sensors will, quote, feel the pulse of the earth, um, extrapolating some of those early ideas uh, from Reynolds across scale. So both both of those examples humanize and corporealize ocean life through the language of metabolic systems. Um, but it's one thing to say that, you know, Icarus produces knowledge that resembles a pacemaker or stethoscope, and it's another to project a pulse um, onto the earth, right? So how do we decide which rhythms constitute a pulse of the planet? Um, I think the new materialist in me would say that ocean ecosystems exceed both the metaphor and the model. Um, which are, you know, essentially anthropomorphic techniques of representational containment um, that emerge from these underwater media networks. So does medicalized media infrastructure um, paradoxically contribute to this sort of Marxist idea of metabolic rift, the separation of humans from the earth and, and from nature by labor, or is it suturing that together? Um, well, we can continue to kind of ponder that uh, through my next example, which is cabled seafloor observatories. Uh, these are internet enabled underwater media platforms. Um, they're often built on top of telecommunications infrastructure and they're described as ocean Fitbits that quote, continuously monitor the pulse and vital signs of the ocean. Um, so I, I find the Fitbit very interesting. Uh, you know, it's a choice that is specific to a culture premised on data extraction and capitalist enclosures in digital space. Um, it also shifts signification from bodily health to, to population optimization, aligning conservation with what Donna Haraway would call, you know, in the informatics of domination. That datification or that creation of an Oceans 2.0 um, is interesting to me in relation to the notion of uh, if we can see it, we can fix it, uh, representational inoculation. So I think a lot of documentary filmmaking um, in our oceans prescribes to some of the same kinds of assumptions that if, if people only knew how important or vulnerable ocean ecosystems are, maybe they'd care more about uh, environmental regulations. And to some extent that's true, right? Because you know, these are media infrastructures that do help designate marine protected areas, but that's not the only thing that they enable. Um, when we think about uh, actual Fitbits, 
that data is monetized in ways that transcend the project of improving health. And similarly, high-tech efforts by, by the West to represent and understand ocean ecologies have all these historical ties to extractive industry, to militarization, um, and to the destruction of those very same ecosystems. So even as we're taking a pulse, we simultaneously have maintained our capacities to end a pulse. Um, and viewed from that angle, the idea of representational inoculation, you know, somewhat greenwashes the history of ocean mediation in favor of this more convenient technological solutionism. That gets me to my final and favorite metaphor, the ultrasound. Um, so I've seen the ultrasound metaphor used for a number of sound-based ocean technologies, everything from soundscape recorders to the echoes of whale songs. And as Jody Berland has argued, these kinds of environmental technologies encourage us to associate planetary depth with bodily interiors. Um, but the ultrasound is not at all a politically neutral choice, right? In the act of um, the U.S. in particular, this unveiling of the fetus on ultrasound is a lot more than medical. It's been, uh, it's part of the ritual of pregnancy. It's used to visually support the perception of fetal autonomy in the battle over abortion rights. And so those associations then around ultrasound as this maternalistic, non-invasive form of imaging have an obvious utility for conservationist studies of noisy soundscapes. You know, whales become kind of like the fetus in the hostile womb of busy shipping corridors. Um, but at the same time, the offshore petroleum industry, you know, also describes its noisy and ecologically destructive seismic surveys as ultrasounds of the earth. And so in this instance, that fetal figure is oil um, and the seabed becomes the container for this resource. So while metaphors like the ultrasound work to explain technological processes, they're also highly fungible. Um, and the fetus and the pulse, you know, in particular, are these, these floating signifiers that can be applied to anything that we decide is valuable. So just to conclude, uh, as ocean observation technologies become more digital, more remote, more tied to computational modes and autonomous platforms, there paradoxically seems to be this renewed emphasis on bodies, on beating hearts and, and medical imaginaries. And that seems to be working to communicate across scale, um, to justify technological interventions, and also I think to inoculate us against the threat of our own detachment uh, from the ocean's ecologies and resources. But I just wanted to end with this question. What do we lose when we reduce caring for our environments uh, to a matter of curing? So I'm gonna stop the share there. Thank you for that brilliant presentation, Lisa. Uh, so just to quickly recap and reorient where we are. So again, this first session is, uh, I believe it's about a little under an hour. We have three speakers, technically four, each speaking for 10 minutes. We're gonna save questions and discussion to the end. If people want to throw in questions and comments in the uh, the chat, I'll collect some of them. Although, you know, we can kind of, we can kind of figure out whether, whether I ventriloquize them or uh, people people speak with their own voice when that comes along. Um, our next uh, presentation has two authors, but I believe one speaker. Uh, so next up is Jonathan Gray and Gabriella Colombo, presenting on hashtag Amazon fires and the online composition of forest politics. Jonathan Gray is senior lecturer in critical infrastructure studies at the Department of Digital Humanities at King College London, where he is currently writing a book on data worlds. He's also the co-founder of the Public Data Lab and a research associate at the Digital Methods Initiative of Amsterdam and the Media Lab in Sciences Po in Paris. And uh, you can find him online at jonathangray.org. Gabriella Colombo, who I believe is co-author, but will not be um, verbalizing in this instance, is a researcher in the field of communication design with a focus on information visualization and visual methods for social research. He is a postdoctoral research fellow in the European Research Project in Common, uh, hosted at Venice. I think he's now uh, a postdoc or something similar with us at King's. And um, he has a PhD uh, in design from Milan. His research and teaching activities revolve around the design of visual tools in support of digital social research, focusing on design of novel strategies for the communication, exploration, analysis, and valorization of collections of images and videos. And if I can just add one more sentence, I mean, 
you know, if the theme of the, 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 one of the themes today is cultural techniques as a manager of crafting and producing environments, enclosure by design, and also enclosure by metaphors, I, you know, I think there's a kind of interesting transition from Lisa's account of various ways of mapping and managing and enclosing uh, the ocean to uh, the work of Jonathan and Gabriella uh, with other questions of media design today as they bear upon our uh, discovery of the environment. Uh, Jonathan, Gabriella, thank you. Floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you uh, so much. Can you hear me now? I'm just checking I'm unmuted. Yes. It's pretty good. Your sound's not quite as good as it was before, but it's quite clear. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, I'll just, hopefully it will be good enough to hear me. But uh, I just wanted to say uh, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for the invitation. Um, this is actually drawing on um, a series of overlapping projects, including Gabriella and uh, Liliana Bunagru, who's also at King's, um, who's not able to join us today, and uh, a broader group that I'll mention in just a moment. But I'll dive straight in, in the interest of time, um, which uh, starts with, in the wake of the 2019 Amazon fires, um, many people commented on the role of hashtags, images, petitions, and platforms in shaping public concern. And uh, what we're going to walk through today is some of the work in progress for an, from an overlapping series of research collaborations on the 2019 Amazon fires, um, which is also moving on to look at um, other kinds of forest fires, forest issues, and uh, restoration efforts with um, some of the same uh, people, um, but these were undertaken with the European Forest Institute, several Brazilian journalists, scientists and civil society groups, as well as a group of researchers associated with the Public Data Lab, Dentist Design and graduate students at King's College London, at least one of which I can see has joined um, Thais, um, who's with us as a graduate student at King's College London, now uh, a research uh, uh, associate. So we set out to explore how critical and inventive repurposing of digital methods of the medium might surface different perspectives on forest society relations, as well as the um, role of the web, online platforms and digital devices in organizing such relations. And we hope these vignettes may feed into uh, discussions around the theme of this symposium uh, on techniques of environmental management and the infrastructuring of nature culture. Um, and uh, to that end, we'd like to invite you for a little tour of four piles that we've been um, uh, mulching in um, trending algorithms, um, posts, hashtags, and images. Um, so for the first part, we look at the algorithmic mediation of environmental events. Uh, Robin Wagner Pasifici writes about how events take shape through concrete material and formal hosts, such as executive orders, letters, trials, handshakes, newspaper articles, photographs, and paintings. And with this spirit, one may take hashtags as a kind of digital object involved in the gathering, making and shaping of environmental events. And there is a longer tangle here, um, which is that the practice of hashtagging on Twitter was said to have emerged with the uh, 2007 San Diego forest fires, leading uh, the founder of Twitter to, to say that um, natural disasters was, uh, was, was, were things that uh, Twitter does well as a platform. Um, so this is a graph of tweets containing hashtags associated with the 2019 Amazon forest fires. And as we can see, there is an initial spike of posts followed by a rapid tailing off over the coming days, which coincides with reports that the Amazon fires were trending. Um, and Twitter's trending topics algorithm is said to prioritize novelty in the form of spikes or surges uh, rather than uh, overall volume of interest. While these hashtags uh, have been used both before and after 2019, there in, is indeed quite a spike that summer, as you can see in this graph. Um, and you can barely detect little bumps around the fires um, um, in the summer of 2020 uh, and subsequently. And just for context, deforestation in 2020 was found to be significant, as shown in this uh, red graph. Um, and NASA suggests, that according to thermal anomalies, uh, something maybe we can return to in the discussion, um, the 2025 season was actually more severe. So the disparity is also reflects in differences, for example, between the 2019 and 2020 Wikipedia pages, as we can see here. Um, the algorithmic mediation of environment uh, events can be read against a broader background um, of histories of what Amitav Ghosh describes as 
disorderly expectations punctuated by improbable catastrophes in cultural representations of environments. Uh, for environmental phenomena to emerge as trending events on Twitter, they must be exceptional, prompting a response which is an order of magnitude apart from what is considered usual. So within um, our Amazon Fires collection, one can see Twitter users engaging with the platform's algorithms in various ways, including as a publicity tactic, as an event hook or social fact, and as a failure, distraction or displacement. Algorithms can be considered to take part in the making of environmental events, not only through computational ordering, but also their reactive effects amongst users alive to the politics and implications of this ordering, including what counts as a significant event. So turning on to the second pile, how might we characterize the 2019 Amazon fires according to this spike in activity? What kind of event is it? Um, media scholars such as Richard Rogers suggest that Twitter may be taken as a storytelling machine to facilitate remote event analysis, for example, by examining most engaged with content in order to tell uh, the story of an event as it unfolds. So looking at the selection of uh, top 10 most retweeted tweets per day, we see many, many different kinds of narratives, uh, frames and concerns. Um, the, the rainforests are construed variously as homes to people, planets and uh, plants and animals. The lungs of the earth, um, which is maybe something we can come back to in discussions. There's, there is something in common um, with Lisa's uh, talk and mentioned of lungs and laced oceans, part of our planet, indigenous lands, agricultural sites, and Brazilian territory. Encouragements to pray are prominent in uh, the first few days, followed by other kinds of calls to actions, to sign petitions, share messages, give voice to affected communities, go vegan, debunk, uh, debunk misleading content, donate funds, to use the Ecosia um, uh, browser extension to plant trees, to boycott and defund companies. Uh, and querying for the names of indigenous communities and territories, only two appeared in more than a handful of uh, these most engaged with uh, tweets. So the most engaged with posts suggest that this collection is dominated by international responses and reactions to the fires, um, as well as responses to these responses, such as accusations that other posts are misleading, reporting on geopolitical exchanges, which frame the fires differently, um, counter narratives, comparisons of accounts, parodies, memes, etc. So in this sense, perhaps the tweet collection can be taken as a particular kind of reception archive for environmental historiography. Um, so the third pile is how we might look beyond the most engaged. So as uh, science and technology uh, studies researchers have undertaken co-word analysis as a relational indicator in collections of scientific texts, co-hashtag analysis has been taken as a way into the dynamics and composition of issues. As media scholars have commented, hashtags are not just markers of topics or communities. They may take on different emergent qualities depending on how they're used. Um, hashtags can indicate topics and events, emotions and actions, subjects and subtexts, aspirations and asides. We used hashtags appearing at least 10 times in the collection as a basis for making uh, this hashtag, uh, our hashtag network, in which uh, we found um, Hashtags related to heated exchanges between Bolsonaro and Macron, um, issues celebrities such as Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, fan culture interventions such as the army of the Korean uh, boy band BTS. We find mobilizations around supply chains, consumption patterns, trade agreements and agricultural practices. And in this sense, hashtags may serve to invite and display a re relations and attachments between entities, issues and communities which may not be expected. So on to the fourth and final pile. Uh, Bruno Latour suggests that scientists sampling soil in the Amazon forest can be viewed as supporting a long chain of transformations, enabling the circulation of references from uh, field sites to reports. Uh, so what forms of public knowledge and action uh, are invited when online platforms, devices and digital objects are involved in the making of environmental events? And what role do images play? As we can see, as some of the most highly engaged with posts involve contested images and visual representations, sometimes described as fake, misleading and bogus. So our collaborators, including um, journalists and uh, colleagues at the European Forest Institute, were particularly keen to delve into such claims. Uh, when looking at the circulation of some of the most engaged with images uh, in the collection, we found that many of them were indeed from places and times other than the Amazon forests in 2019. Uh, but looking beyond uh, representational um, 
the representational infidelities of images. We also trace the circulation and social lives of images in this collection in order to get a sense of what else they are doing. Um, as Hito Steyl comments, digital images are not just about the real thing, but also their own real conditions of existence, including their transformation, recontextualization, appropriation, exploitation, and dispersion. And as can be seen here, we find different versions and variations of an image, including near copies with minor modifications, screenshots, including screenshot debunking, showing the context in which they are shared, shared and memified versions with other visual elements overlaid or juxtaposed. So what can be taken from these four piles, especially regarding um, cultural techniques and environmental management? So previous studies have examined what it means to talk about ecologies, landscapes or infrastructures in relation to forests. Um, these terms and, implicate, and their implications are particularly weighty um, in relation to the Amazon rainforests, given uh, histories of indigenous communities, colonialism, conservation and uh, socio-environmentalist organizing. How do digital objects and devices figure can we say that they infrastructure ecologies? Are they part of infrastructural ecologies? What have the web, social media platforms and their associated digital objects got to do with forests? And how do they uh, distribute and perhaps redistribute agency in environmental politics and narratives associated with it? So delving further into the archive provides further insights into how digital objects were involved in the making, contestation and negotiation of meanings, representations and relations around uh, forests and fires, as well as surfacing different kinds of actors, concerns and invited action. Uh, the Twitter archive unfurls different conceptions of what the fires were and are as an environmental event. Through interpretation exercises with our collaborators, objects in the archive served as prompts to rethink the sites, actors and formats of environmental politics and the making of environmental events online including what it means to talk about uh, government stakeholders and communication and misinformation in this context. So rather than reinforcing what Alex Singh calls the anti-politics machines of environmental governance, converting social issues into technical ones, might we repurpose these sorts of materials and archives to make what George Saunders calls reconsideration machines, resituating environmental events. And amidst the many lively responses and counter responses in the archive, uh, I just wanted to close by saying the absence of reporting involving affected communities, human and not, present at the scene of the fires uh, becomes even more conspicuous. And perhaps this is an apt way to end on Earth Day to share a moment to pause and think not only of planetary scale changes, but also the organisation of transnational environmental events, the absences that their archives carry, and how digital objects and infrastructures might be involved in composing things differently, learning from longer standing cultures of coexistence. Uh, happy Earth Day. Thank you. <coughs> So thank you, Jonathan, Gabriella, and Liliana. Um, so our final speaker for this first panel is Gunesh Tabman, uh, speaking on ecological imaginaries in the smart cities. Um, so Gunesh is a lecturer in digital innovation and education in the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London. She gained her PhD from Birkbeck, uh, the University of London, with a research uh, project on open data uh, driven practices, initiatives, and discourses in the context of smart city planning in London. Prior to her PhD, uh, Gunesh worked at a civil society organization in Istanbul, where she carried out policy research on ICT, digital innovation, and e-government. Uh, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you, Bernard. Um, so my presentation or talk rather, because I'm not going to use any slides, will be more of a theoretical provocation. Um, and I will be basically asking question rather than um, talking about finished research. So um, hopefully um, it'll be interesting. So um, in this short intervention today, I want to ask how we can come up with um, new instruments of urban epistemologies so that we can construct the urban as a site of ecological richness. Um, I'm proposing this approach as counter to what Bernard and his co-authors, um, Orit Halpern and Robert Mitchell called um, the smartness mandate. As they observed, the smartness mandate is inextricably tied to the language of crisis, including ecological events. From IBM's smart 
first proposals to London School of Economics um, Cities Research Group, um, or from United Nations uh, Global Urbanism Project to many academic articles written on the subject, uh, most of the policy and research documents begin with depicting the urban site, uh, urban, as a site of pollution, sickness, raising population, in addition to other problems such as inadequate transportation, health services, and so on. So firstly, I will try and show um, how the relationship between data and urban infrastructure enables the coupling of the urban and these maladies in smart city proposals although these problems are not the consequences of urbanism particularly. So to do this, I will use um, Gilbert Simondon's um, concept of transduction to explain the relation between urban infrastructure and data in a processual and relational way. Uh, after that, uh, for very shortly, I will give the example of Matthew Gandhi's work on reimagining urban ecology to show that the urban environment may as well be understood as a site of biodiversity and ecological richness. Um, I find this important to think about, as I believe that such a shift in thinking about and experiencing of urban environments could help city dwellers reconnect with the nature around them in novel ways uh, that may actually result in more engagement with environmental issues. Um, so I've been thinking um, about this for a while, for a, for a few years, um, actually. So in the genesis of individual, um, Simone Don explains transaction as the process by which the individuation occurs through ontogenic uh, ontogenetic modulation and reiteration. Here, the term ontogenesis designates the development of the being or its becoming. Through this analytic framework, one explores um, space and codes um, uh, in a non representational mode. So, this means the focus shifts from exploring what we are to how they become. Um, therefore, it helps to see when transduction of data and urban infrastructure takes place. This process iteration is embedded within and also contributing to the discourse that conceptualizes the urban as a site of ecological crisis. When data and urban infrastructure transduction occurs, it always happens in relation to the environment they are in. When they individuate together, relationality emerges as key to the process of transduction. However, as um, Adrienne McKenzie warns us, relationality in the context of transduction does not refer to coming together of separate substances in a contingent way, because this would mean that these substances are pre-constituted entities, whereas for Simon Don, uh, individual things within a transductive domain individuate in relation to each other. Therefore, what, I, what I'm trying to say is um, data-driven urbanism is not a combination of two distinct beings, the urban and the data, where data technologies develop discreetly and then get applied onto the urban infrastructure to generate a quantitative representation of it. Instead, during this process, they become together in relation to each other. Since they all possess degrees of technicity, the relation between data, software, and the urban infrastructure cannot be explored separately, um, separate from the processes they facilitate. In other words, to understand the implications of data-driven technologies on the infrastructure it runs, we need to think through software and data in the context of the urbanism they're enacting. Because the individuation is never a standalone process, but always an ontogenetic um, process in the development of the larger entity. The process, process of individualization is never complete and always takes place within an uh, associated milieu. Um, Simon Don says, individualization is made possible by recurrent causality in an environment that the technical being creates around itself. Due to this recurrent relation, as Adrian McKenzie puts it, um, through transduction, a domain uh, structures itself as a partial 
always a complete solution to a relational problem. Therefore, code solves re um, relational problems while transducing the urban space uh, through which the space is individuated. However, with each solution to a problem, there emerges another relational problem. Um, when the urban is becoming through its transduction with data, it always takes place within a larger network of diverse rea realities and latent potentials that might be political, economic, affective, and cultural. Subsequently, the discourse that performs the urban defines it through relational, but not essential problems that might relate to migration, pollution, sickness, um, lack of employment, and so on, which are um, presented to require more innovation and new data technologies. This is why within the smartness mandate, crisis is, as Halpern and Gunnar put, um, a normal human condition and extends itself by means of a field of um, plural agents that interact in a complex manner whereby data-driven solutions perpetually defer the impending environmental destruction. So until now, I briefly um, try to show uh, or argue that the um, data-driven city is the transductive domain for both data and urban, whereby data articulate and perform what urban might be. Therefore, we need to raise questions regarding the organists uh, Brenner and Schmidt did. Um, they ask, through what categories, methods, and cartographies should urban life be understood? As they remind us, um, in 1970, Lef Lefebvre uh, had already made a case for urban becoming an episteme in its own right. Urban... Um, uh, he argued that urban is a privileged lens that is used as essential epistemological and political precondition for understanding the nature of society itself. As such, the urban is best seen as a theorization or a process and not a discrete category. Therefore, considering that both data and the urban are always in formation, then today I want to ask, can we theorize a different understanding of the urban by thinking of other types of epistemologies that are outside of the boundaries of the smartness uh, mandate? This can be digital or otherwise. For example, Shannon Mattern argues, instead of more gratuitous per metric modeling, we need to think about urban epistemologies that embrace memory and history, that recognize spatial intelligence as sensory and experiential, that consider other species' ways of knowing, that appreciate the wisdom of local crowds and communities, that acknowledge the information embedded in the city, in the city's facades, flora, statuary and stairways that aim to integrate forms of distributed cognition, paralleling our brains on distributed cognitive processes. Through such an approach to urban intelligence that goes beyond the summer smartness mandate, can we capture ecological diversity in the urban instead of equating it to a site of pollution and degradation? This may sound like a whimsical idea, but as Matthew Gandhi and his project team in the University of um, Cambridge show, um, the urban ecological infrastructure is much richer than it is generally thought. For instance, marginal spaces such as wastelands may indeed engender spaces of um, ecological diversity. Another example is that they found that the war ruins and rubble in Berlin gave way to a whole new fauna and flora that were previously not present in the city. However, under the conditions whereby policymakers and city administrators jump in the uh, technological solutions wagon, we see an obsession with smart city agendas instead of preserving ecological diversity in the urban. Of course, this is ironic on many levels, since as these technologies come with a promise of enabling sustainability in the urban, but the cost of these technologies to the earth is largely concerning. Besides this, as Gandhi's project shows in London, for example, there has been a huge cutback to, the, to state funding for taxonomic research, as well as nature conservation agencies, which resulted in the shortages of skill that specializes on um, biological indicators such as insects. 
Uh, moreover, as they note, biodiversity uh, policies and the protection, protection of wild nature is often driven by a public relations emphasis rather than generating detailed knowledge about sites, species and the ecological dynamics. So today I want to leave you with a question on how can we change this? How can we create, recreate an urban discourse that includes various forms of um, epistemologies beyond those of big data to appreciate and cultivate biological diversity in our urban areas. So thank you, Gunesh. Um, let me think. Uh, my screen here with Gunesh froze. Hope that uh, you can still at least hear and see me. Yeah, I think you can. Uh, so we have about 10 minutes now for discussion. Um, I can kick off a question unless I see uh, a hand jump up or get raised. Uh, meanwhile, uh, do I hear or see any immediate questions? Um, I don't think so. Um, we have one in the Q and A, um, but it was just—it's about are satellites capable of measuring plastic pollution? Um, mm -hmm. Is there truly a measure of how many fishing nets are polluting our oceans? Um, from Martin uh, Martin Herman von Drayton, uh, and and I'll just answer that by saying I actually don't know the answer to that question. I think you'd have to ask an oceanographer who's working with satellite imaging. Um, but I do know that satellites are certainly used to track other kinds of pollution. I'm just not sure uh, about their use specifically for fishing nets or plastic pollution. I have but, a so I have a question. It's more like a, a provocation. Uh, to, to, to kind of flesh out some ideas. I mean, it did seem to me, I don't know if it's fair to say, among the three top three three talks, you know, it seemed to me Gunesh really laid out a strong case for a particular type of, you know, a new type of ontology of how it is that media and the environment produce one another, right? And I think Jonathan was, it sounded to me at first since like Jonathan and his co-authors were interested particularly in mapping and understanding visibility, you know, and in a certain sense, Lisa was kind of moving back and forth between both understanding how the sea gets invested with techniques, but also limits to the, those techniques, right? Um, and so the first question is if, if people feel like that's an accurate description and to what extent do we actually, if, if you know, Gunesh is actually, I think Gunesh is offering through Simon Don a model of technical and environmental becoming together, to what extent that needs to be a, a starting point or if, uh, if other perspectives might be sufficient? Well, I mean, um, can I jump in? <laughs> Please, yes. Um, I think my point is, um, well, first of all, um, if it came across as um, my case is like technological determinist, it's really not what I'm trying to do at all. Um, so, I, I mean, I suppose my point is the um, when data technologies are part of um, urban infrastructure. And I actually argued that they are like they are now an urban infrastructure and it's hard to understand um, where infrastructure starts and where it ends, where data starts, where it ends. Like I, I argue that they keep producing, reproducing yeah. each other. And uh, while they keep reproducing each other, they also um, enact a certain way of uh, urbanism. Um, I mean, although it may sound like an technological determinist uh, proposal, I also think that there's actually quite um, um, some opportunities there um, to think about things in a different way um, or like to divert this relationship. Um, but um, I'm saying this is the best. I mean, <laughs> I mean they're like a, um, this whole idea of like relational becoming as is, uh, is uh, studied by many different um, theorists um, in different ways and um, um, so yeah I'm not insisting mine is the best approach but um, that's what I suggest or bring to the table I suppose. Um, if I can jump in uh, Ganesh I really liked your your use of transduction as thinking about as a way of thinking about this relational becoming um, with the smartness 
um, mandate. And I think there are some interesting ways in which our, our case studies um, relate. You know, you have your urban epistemologies on the one hand, and then the ocean, which is kind of kind of like has this imaginary as this or wilderness, right? Um, and so uh, what really struck me about what you said um, was about how how this also kind of mediates the question of crisis as um, as it becomes the default um, or as there's a, a kind of a sense of perpetual de deferment of crisis. Um, and I think that's one place where all three of our talks kind of um, line up interestingly. So I'm thinking also about um, Jonathan's discussion of how um, environmental issues become trending and like what that does to our perception of environmental crisis as well. Um, so maybe we could also, I mean, talk a little bit about those connections there. Yeah, I mean, um, the reason why I got um, to this point is like when I was doing my PhD, when I was um, like working on smart city proposals, like I said in my talk, um, pretty much all the research at the time or um, policy um, documents started with the point of doom, like a pending doom is coming. So this is smart technologies is the answer to that. But actually, if you just um, look into all these um, problems they are talking about that is pertaining to urban, um, like actually these problems are more severe in non-urban areas. Like for instance, the lack of transportation is actually transporting is so much more of a serious issue problem in rural areas or health services, lack of healthcare. Actually people live in the cities for, um, because there is a good transportation service or because there is a good health service. So um, yeah, that's, that's, and um, I think, in that sense, like um, what I thought about, yeah, like your presentation is the uh, same similar thing is happening with the oceans and like just constantly a site of crisis, etc. So like which requires an intervention of digital technologies um, and it keeps like this whole thing keeps perpetuating itself. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I I agree. Like there are lots of like similar issues there, like in the way that it keeps regenerating itself and reinforcing itself. Yeah. I don't see any hands. So I'm I'm gonna add a another comment. I mean, I do wonder. Um, in actually, in the light of this, there's something about Jonathan's talk that I found slightly disturbing, in the sense that uh, you know, Lisa. It seemed to me like Lisa and Gunesh we're giving different at moments ambivalent accounts of this mutual production of technology and the environment. And certainly certainly not technologically determinist, but uh, you know, whereas it did seem to me like Jonathan's talk actually reminded me a little bit of um, a problem of something like, this is a term from Shane Denson, of kind of discorrelation. The fact that there's, you know, Jonathan has this wonderful mapping of the way this crisis uh, in the in the Amazon becomes visible, but at the same time, I wasn't. It was. It also suggested to me there was a lot of disconnect, and that the Twitter had its kind of, you know, and so, and that 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 to me sort of suggests actually something about this technical mediation runs the risk of being totally inadequate to the material and life problems of environmental crisis. Does that? Is that is that an unfair interpretation of what you're saying, Jonathan? Not at all. I think, um, yeah. I mean, I I, I also really loved um, uh, kind of putting that work next to uh, Lisa and Ganesh's work um, because it sort of drew out things which I didn't have time to, to also get into, but which were really deeply concerning along the way, um, such as what it means to talk about um, how. Uh, social media platforms and the web are involved in the making of environmental events um, against the background of um, you know the knowledge politics of the Amazons being like extremely fraught um, against the background of um, not only kind of uh, uh, you know sort of STS um, uh, studies of the making of forests but also kind of political mobilization around um, socio-environmentalism as a sort of technique and as an approach to surfacing local uh, knowledges and longer histories of entanglements between cultures and ecologies, um, which I think is kind of important to affirm. Um, and, but also, I mean, which is not just to say that somehow it's social media alone um, or the web alone, which is troubling, like even some of those um, 
of the layering on of kind of satellite data and satellite imagery as a way of construing the Earth as a sort of body. And it was interesting, um, Lisa, what you're saying about kind of um, uh, the sort of metal of the body. The lungs of the Earth came up a lot. There is a longer history of um, programs to kind of internationalize the Amazon, which is very interesting. Like Macron alluded to that sort of, and also um, NASA as the t- as the temperature taking uh, body of the planet, um, which also comes to, do, you know, that relates in a not straightforward way to how we know about uh, planetary crisis um, and the means through which we kind of uh, arrive at that. Um, so, yeah, I don't think it was, um, I'm glad that you felt troubled because it certainly was a, it was a troubling um, project in many ways. So I, if I, do I have the time right? So we have, we're dealing with multiple time zones. I think we need to take a quick pause. Mm-hmm. Then we're going to have a few more uh, presentations, uh, followed by a discussion that will hopefully tie everything together a little bit. Does that sound right, Lisa? Yes, that sounds um, right. So why don't we, um, we'll, t- we'll take a pause from the discussion. You know, if you have questions, definitely, um, I hope you continue to percolate them, um, put them into the Q&A, and uh, we'll sort of try to address them in the next discussion session. Um, So for now, we're going to move on to our second panel. Um, And to kick us off, we have Ed Finn. Um, So Ed, if you want to go, if you have any uh, visuals, you can go ahead and and share your slides. Um, Ed Finn is is the founding director of the Science for, sorry, for the, the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University, where he is uh, an associate professor in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society and the School of Arts, Media, and Engineering. He also serves as the academic director of Future Tense, a partnership between ASU, New America, and Slate Magazine, and a co director of Emerge, an annual festival of art, ideas, and future. Ed's research and teaching incorporate, or sorry, explore the workings of imagination digital culture, creative collaboration, and the intersection of the humanities, uh, arts, and sciences. He is the author of What Algorithms Want, Imagination in the Age of Computing, uh, and co-editor of Future Tense Fiction. Um, uh, uh, Frankenstein, annotated for scientists, engineers, and creators of all kinds, and Hieroglyph, Stories and Visions for a Better Future, among other books. So uh, take it away, Ed. Okay. Um, Hello, everybody. Uh, Thank you so much for including me. It's great to see you all virtually. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about a project we have and sort of take this idea of techniques for positive climate futures as a kind of a challenge or or to talk about a project that we have been working on and trying to actually do this and and, um, sort of make a broader public impact. And I want to start by talking about imagination, uh, not just as a concept, but a kind of method, a tool. Uh, and, um, you know, so we can begin with this, the mission of a, a Center for Science and the Imagination, which is in many ways an infrastructure project, uh, cognitive, social, and yes, even imaginary infrastructure. Uh, by chance, earlier this week, we hosted an event with Future Tense uh, with the Secretary of Transportation, Pete Buttigieg, uh, and several of our science fiction writer collaborators. And now the topic was imagining transportation futures. So there's this really interesting intersection between the notion of infrastructure and what I think of as this uh, collective capacity to engage with and imagine possible futures. Uh, so that's on YouTube if you want to check it out and it's infrastructures all the way down. So, uh, okay, what, what, what do we mean by imagination? Um, I want to propose, I think there, that, that's, uh, there are many different threads we could pull on there. And so uh, from a starting point as a kind of working definition, I wanna talk about imagination as the ignition system for a lot of other things we know we really care about are important, things like foresight, empathy, and resilience. Uh, it's this cognitive capacity that everybody has. Uh, little kids are, you know, seem to have it most often, and then we manage to pound it out of most people through formal education, and then turn around later and wonder what happened and why we live in these uh, crises of imagination, uh, live in poverty of imagination, live in failures of imagination. Uh, and I don't think I need to point out all of the places that those are are unfolding around the world right now. Um, so. Uh, 
I want to jump from there and get into uh, the subject of, of climate and ecology through Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, who's uh, uh, you know, one of our, our great fellow travelers and has been someone we admire immensely. And if you're familiar with his book, Ministry for the Future, he is very directly trying to engage with this question of how we change our collective imaginary. And I was really struck when he wrote this essay in The New Yorker uh, early on in the pandemic, pointing out how uh, the how, how the the trends the the shifts the social shifts of the pandemic signal the possibility of other kinds of large scale shifts. Um, so, Ministry for the Future has inspired a number of public conversations about what a large scale collective effort to decarbonize human activity might look like. Um, and Robinson is pointing out, you know, at the time that this essay came out, that. that uh, we began to contemplate collectively the power of this tiny virus to achieve what countless climate scientists and advocates have not, a rapid large-scale transformation of carbon emissions, at least temporarily. Flights were grounded, industries ground to a halt, the streets emptied of traffic in major cities around the globe. We caught a glimpse of what Robinson terms, echoing Raymond Williams, a new structure of feeling. And so the question we are taking on in a broad sense through the work of our center is, how do, we, how do we do that? How do we think about a structure of feeling as a kind of imaginative infrastructure? What would it mean to try to build something like that? Uh, or perhaps a, more realistically, a retrofit the kind of structures of feeling we're living in right now? So one key question Robinson gestures towards is how do we imagine more positive climate futures? Even the most politically engaged and policy savvy, technically grounded people who have been in the trenches of climate work for, for years, for decades, often have a pretty limited vision of what the future should look like. You know, sometimes they're talking about really abstract measures, uh, numbers of parts per million, or avoiding particular kinds of lurid catastrophe that haunt us. But it's really hard to articulate a compelling, positive vision of the world that we want. So in order to motivate transformational change, that's what we need. We need more stories of desirable futures. We need to educate our desires, as Miguel Avanzur has put it, and inspire change in the present with inspiring visions of the future. Going further, I think that one of humanity's greatest collective challenges is that far too few of us feel empowered to imagine our own futures. So this is, I think, the question, this is an imaginative infrastructure question. So this was the inspiration for the project I want to talk briefly about today, the Climate Imagination Fellowship, which we're hosting this year at the Center for Science of the Imagination. This fellowship builds on now uh, coming on a decade of climate futures work, different projects we've engaged in here, um, at, and you know, all building on the spirit of uh, the, the idea that our futures are all linked together and the spirit of Octavia Butler, if we want to voyage to the stars, we first need to figure out things here on earth. Uh, so we've done now three uh, global climate futures writing contests where we've uh, uh, invited uh, hundreds of, uh, we've received hundreds of submissions from 50 or 60 countries around the world engaging in positive climate futures. And we've published some more targeted uh, constrained uh, anthologies uh, on solar futures in the Southwest uh, supported with, with colleagues here at ASU and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, National Science Foundation, the, the Department of Energy uh, with a weight of light and cities of light. And both of these, again, are really infrastructure, imagination infrastructure projects asking, well, what if we have a major energy infrastructure transformation in the American Southwest? What is it going to feel like? What is it going to look like to live in that future? Um, we pursue this work at the intersection of speculative fiction and what we sometimes call policy futures. So we'll bring writers, artists, social scientists, engineers, humanists, policy experts together uh, and challenge them to work together to imagine positive climate futures through a range of different constraints. Uh, and so these are experiments not in predicting the future, but in exploring a broader possibility space, and most importantly of all, of all, modeling a different structure of feeling. So our Climate Imagination Fellowship is, is ongoing this year. We have these four fantastic fellows uh, hailing from uh, Mexico, China, Nigeria, and <clears throat> India and the United States. Uh, this project is supported by the Climate Works Foundation, and it's been really fascinating to see this tremendous outpouring of positive engagement. Uh, these fellows have uh, been invited to speak and collaborate with uh, entities like the UN High Level Climate Champions Team, uh, TED's Project Countdown, the British Library, Hate Festival Arequipa, our own Future Tense, the Journal of Science Policy and Governance, and this is really just scratching the surface 
Uh, and again, these fellows, the goal of this project is for them to uh, author their own positive climate futures, engaging with local realities and contexts in different parts of the world, but also to model how more, many more people should be doing this. One playful aspect of this you may want to check out or perhaps share with students or colleagues is postcards from the future. This is an exercise you know, others have done before, but we've created a set of uh, climate themed uh, postcards from the future. Uh, and our, our hope in some small way is to begin the work of emancipating collective imagination, to inspire individuals and communities around the world to begin imagining their own climate futures. Uh, these are just a, some of the images designed by Brazilian artist João Queiroz who hails from the Amazonian state of Rondonia, uh, some of whose other work uh, explores Amazofuturism, as he calls it, that mixes solar punk, cyberpunk, and indigenous people's cultures and an indigenous futures artistic uh, project. Uh, really fantastic work, and we're so honored to be able to work with him. And it, for these images, you know, these are not supposed to be any particular place, uh, any particular location on Earth, but they're supposed to invite uh, you as the potential postcard writer to imagine yourself or a friend in this future and to write a short message and send this off to engage in this very simple low threshold thought experiment well what might it be like what might it feel like to live in this future um, this project is is still continuing and the next phase for us is we're beginning to put together a, a climate action almanac uh, drawing on novella length fiction from our, our four fellows as well as splash fiction nonfiction essays from a range of different contributors, some original artwork, some of those postcards from the future submissions, um, and, and probably more stuff too. Uh, and we're really excited to think of this as a springboard for continuing this broader conversation about imaginative infrastructure. How do we uh, engage broader publics and invite uh, many different communities ar around the world, local communities, small communities, individuals, young people, as well as broader regional, national, or, or uh, uh, other constructs to start imagining more positive climate futures. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, I love that. Thank you for sharing those fascinating projects. And um, I love the way that you're connecting imaginative infrastructure here to, to structure a feeling. Um, I think we can continue to explore that with, uh, some of the other presentations in this panel, which uh, maybe perhaps turn from positive imaginaries to um, some more apocalyptic ones. Uh, so we'll start with Jacob Green. Uh, Jacob Green is an assistant professor of English in the Writing, Rhetorics, and Literacies program at Arizona State University. His research investigates the rhetorical implications of mobile and spatial computing technologies. Um, so his forthcoming monograph, Composing Place, Digital Rhetorics for a Mobile World, forwards a set of theoretical, practical, and pedagogical frameworks for engaging with the unique affordances of locative and augmented media. Um, so go ahead, Jake. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking uh, today about uh, re-photography, um, both in somewhat in mobile contexts, but uh, kind of more broadly as a uh, activist and rhetorical practice. Um, so to give some examples here, um, Re-photography, uh, what are more commonly known as uh, kind of before and after images are uh, probably things you're pretty familiar with if you're in uh, environmental media studies, um, uh, essentially taking uh, uh, pictures of the same location at different points in time to demonstrate uh, the environmental changes that have taken place uh, for a particular location. Um, and this uh, particular practice um, has become kind of more and more popular uh, over the years, particularly as climate change uh, begins to impact uh, different communities, especially marginalized communities uh, across the globe. Um, so these images are kind of compiled uh, often, you know, people like NASA uh, or other activist organizations or even uh, environmental re-photographers. Uh, Mark Klett, who's at uh, ASU, actually is one of the um, uh, one of the main kind of inventors of this technique for artistic practices. Um, so re-photography is obviously a very powerful uh, kind of tool as someone who studies rhetoric uh, and persuasion. Um, this is a very powerful tool in terms of how we, you know, think about the environment, uh, certainly how we, how we study it, but also how we communicate that to a broader public, public and how we um, think about the environment as a persuasive artifact, how we turn particular landscapes into persuasive artifacts to, uh, you know, uh, inspire action uh, in some way. 
And actually this morning, uh, as I was uh, checking Google, uh, I saw an example uh, of re-photography in my search bar uh, for today's uh, Google image for Earth Day. Um, I'm not exactly sure what this specific landscape is. If anybody knows, they can, they can stick it in the chat. Um, but it's just showing, you know, 20 year change uh, to what looks like an Arctic, uh, an Arctic region. Oh, they have the, they have the globe right here um, uh, to show the location. So possibly Greenland, uh, I assume. Um, so this is kind of um, a very chirotic uh, moment, good timing uh, for, the, for this talk uh, in terms of thinking about re-photography as this kind of public rhetorical practice. And one of the things that I've kind of noticed in thinking about uh, re-photography as rhetorical um, is kind of what this image is doing on Google, uh, which is kind of taking these particular location, these very specific ecologies and kind of abstracting them uh, maybe even flattening them into a circulable uh, digital object to uh, you know, motivate publics uh, into action uh, of some kind. Uh, so part of my interest in uh, re-photography was spurred when I saw uh, the documentary Chasing Cor Coral, which I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with. It's a popular Netflix documentary, uh, but basically depicts a, uh, tells a story uh, of a group of environmental uh, activists, uh, oceanographers, uh, and underwater photographers uh, who are capturing uh, some of the first images of coral reef bleaching uh, around uh, 2015. Um, and it's a fantastic documentary, um, uh, a really compelling story of the amount of work that it took to, to capture this image, capture these images uh, of, of dying coral reefs across different Caribbean uh, environments. Um, you know, part of the um, and, you know, part of the new technologies they had to create in order to capture these images, a lot of the technical challenges uh, that they faced uh, in the process. It's a really compelling um, story. Um, and, you know, I was personally moved uh, when I first saw this, you know, it really kind of, um, you know, changes, you know, seeing these rapid changes take place. Um, but really the, the narrative of the documentary is kind of a rephotographic, is kind of centers on the rhetorical power of the images that they're capturing and what those images uh, are going to do. Um, throughout the document, they talk about, you know, if people could see these changes happening, they would care. Um, you know, there's lots of references um, within the movie to this kind of assumed public that the that the images are going to be created for. So, um, and one of the kind of the most uh, interesting scenes in the documentary that captures this idea is this moment where the photographers have to, they travel, I think it's in New Caledonia, uh, they're traveling to capture some images of a, uh, of a bleached coral reef, you can kind of see it down here, and the best way to access access it ironically is off the uh, of this floating restaurant and so this is a perfect moment uh, for the people creating the documentary to kind of show that stark juxtaposition between you know these environmental uh, changes happening uh, you know these bleached coral reefs um, and then these kind of oblivious party goers so they show you know obviously dancing music you know they're drinking having a good time and then that's that's set over a somber soundtrack of the photographers you know taking these images who are you know throughout the doc documentary kind of getting heartbroken about you know seeing these uh, these reefs dying with seemingly nobody caring about it and so that's a scene that kind of captures this idea of this kind of oblivious or maybe complacent sense of complacency that these rephotographic images are trying to interact with uh, in some way. So this is kind of assumed, I think, complacent public that's always kind of imagined um, in discourses about re re environmental rephotography and what their effects are on particular public. So I'm trying to think uh, in this work with environmental rephotography, how that's a very, you know, kind of reductive or simplified notion of the way uh, images work and uh, the way images are rhetorical. And I think uh, Robert Harriman and John Luke Cates capture this idea uh, very well, this kind of reductive idea of images when they write that. It's the idea that a documentary image creates a direct encounter between the viewer and the subject that produces a moral shock, which then produces a decisive effect. So people see these images, you know, whether it's the uh, from chasing coral images that they're, that, they're, uh, that they're gathering or, you know, the images that are on Google today produces some kind of moral shock, which produces an effect, you know, so it's obviously this kind of simplified, almost emotional encounter, or this, you know, what we might call in rhetoric, you know, a conversion practice, you have this conversionary moment where, you know, you're, uh, you have this moral crisis that then now you're inspired to act or to, to do something, you know, about climate change. 
Um, so I'm trying to think through, you know, what rephotography actually is doing, because I think that's a very reductive idea uh, of what images do, particularly not just at an individual level, but when you broaden that out to a wider public, um, becomes much more complex. Um, so I'm thinking about rephotography lately through this idea of uh, gestures of concern, which is a book by Chris Ingraham um, that I think maybe gets at you know what what rephotography is doing because I definitely think it's a powerful rhetorical artifact uh, for activists to use, and it's important to see these images, uh, particularly in places where climate change is not you know just something that's going to happen in the future, uh, but that has already happened or is happening right now. Uh, these are important. Seeing those changes is really important in communicating them, and re-photography is a part of that. Um, so his idea um, is basically thinking about these as gestures, as effectively generative, um, and the way they reorient our modes of thinking or searching such that we see the potential for things to be otherwise than they are. Um, to do so is to cultivate a sense of interdependence and connectivity that makes us worthy of sustaining such an attitude without succumbing to the cynicism wrought by its recurrent disappointment. And so he uh, he doesn't talk about rephotography specifically uh, in the book, at least I don't think so. Um, he talks about kind of other things, you know, bumper stickers even, um, sharing on social media, things like that. He's creating this kind of, he calls it an effective commonwealth. Um, kind of keep almost like keeping a conversation going, keeping things um, kind of in uh, public consciousness in a sense. Um, and so the pandemic also offered another opportunity to think about what the role of rephotographic practices uh, in environmental activism or thinking about climate change. Um, this was kind of a an image series collected by The Guardian, uh, I think, uh, where they actually had a, a sliding toolbar where you could see different pollution levels uh, when the pandemic first started, how pollution decreased uh, in certain to see in some of my own research with mobile and locative media, uh, these rephotographic practices uh, beginning to emerge in uh, augmented reality contexts uh, and locative contexts. So this first one, it's a project, uh, I think it's now defunct by Nathan Schaefer, uh, which is at the Exit Glacier um, uh, in Glacier National Park. And uh, it shows uh, the idea of his app as you could walk along uh, this particular pathway to see different visualizations uh, of where the glacier once stood or how much of the glacier has uh, melted uh, at different points in time. Um, and so there's similar projects kind of popping up uh, in augmented reality, virtual reality contexts that are similarly trying to show uh, here's environmental change over time, whether it's time-lapse imagery uh, or more explicitly a kind of rephotographic practice where uh, the image that you see with, through a screen is some sort of past uh, and then the present, uh, obviously, is what's happening uh, kind of in your current surroundings. And then a similar project, uh, Justin Bryce Griglia's After Ice, uh, which shows uh, kind of a future uh, for thinking of uh, imagination, uh, the way imagination draws on, could draw on locative data or geolocative data uh, to help you visualize what you know sea level rise would look like uh, based on the location of your um, of your device. Uh, so a couple of examples, you know, not exactly rephotography. Um, but think also thinking about, you know, how these technologies mediate um, uh, how we interact with our surroundings and thinking about mobile media in that sense, almost like an environmental infrastructure uh, moving forward. And the way that activists are drawing on this to create um, these kind of rhetorical experiences. Uh, so some, some parting questions that I'm, I'm kind of thinking about uh, with this. Um, is basically what is the role of rephotographic practice in environmental activism uh, beyond just simply, um, you know, shocking uh, people into, you know, caring about climate change or to do something, particularly with a problem um, that is so large and overwhelming. Uh, and this is similar to what Catherine Yusuf writes um, about the problem of universalizing uh, climate change. Um, there's this violent homogenization that takes place. Um, in terms of ignoring, you know, the, the very real problems that are happening uh, for people uh, in those specific environments where we take images from and then circulate them as these kind of flattened rhetorical artifacts to inspire you know, a universal public. Um, but then also thinking about, you know, as rephotography becomes mediated into uh, new media environments, AR, VR, things like that, uh, how can they not just be, you know, a rhetorical panacea, you know, for shocking people, but also a platform for uh, deliberation, you know, adaptive uh, solutions, you know, kind of some of the work that um, Ed Finn seems to be doing uh, in the Center for Science and Imagination um, could be really, really interesting. And there's some other uh, photographic practices that people are taking up 
um, to think about um, uh, those possibilities. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jake. Um, lots to talk about there. I think uh, we've got some very interesting questions happening as well um, that we'll address uh, soon. But um, for now, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to Joanna Zelinska. Um, so Joanna Zelinska is an artist, writer, curator, and professor of media philosophy and critical digital practice at King's College London. She is an author of a number of books, including AI Art, Machine Visions and Warped Dreams, uh, The End of Man, A Feminist Counter Apocalypse, and Non Human Photography. So her art practice involves experimenting with different kinds of image based media. In 2013, she was artistic director of uh, Transitio MX05 Biomediations, the biggest Latin American new media festival, which took place in Mexico City. She is currently researching perception and cognition as boundary zones between human and machine intelligence. Um, so on to you, Joanna. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Lisa, for your introduction and thank you to yourself and Bernard for putting on this event and for putting us in touch with colleagues from ASU. Look forward to further conversations. Now we've been asked not to do polished papers. So my presentation is more a performance than a talk. It will demonstrate my method of engaging with planetary level concerns about our human positioning within the world's ecologies. This method responds to a situation when our very existence is being challenged by the uncertainty about what comes next, a climate collapse, cross-species extinction, another pandemic, a third world war, death by AI, or maybe a sunnier tomorrow for all of us. So developed at the nexus of broken dreams and collapsed infrastructures, my mode of dealing with these issues combines philosophical inquiry with critical media practice to offer a series of cultural techniques for working through the multiple crises we are currently facing. And I'd like to show you a one minute clip from a relatively old film of mine called Exit Man. The belief in seemingly interminable growth has led to depletion, scarcity, and the crisis of biological and social life. This apocalyptic state of events has been called the Anthropocene. Stretching back at least 250 years to the early days of fossil fuel excavation and burning, the Anthropocene can't be seen, and hence known, by us contemporary humans because of the vastness of time across which it has unfolded. It can only be visualized, singularly yet repeatedly. Such visualizations usually draw on apocalyptic tropes straight from the Book of Revelation, images of the blackening of the sun, of heaven falling onto the earth, of lands being moved out of their places. Yet they only show us what we are capable of seeing, while hiding the most dramatic message of the Anthropocene, the end of man and everything else. No picture can convey the fact that soon there will be nothing to see, and no one to see it. Current Anthropocene visuality ultimately has a mollifying effect. We are the sl now, so how do we deal with this message of there being, there seemingly being no future? So my way of approaching the problem of infrastructural ecologies with all the precarity these ecologies currently experience is through adopting the position of a feminist eco-eco-punk. Departing from the traditional philosophical method of avoiding the present, doubting the example, and remaining suspicious about praxis, my media thinking is also a form of media making, and through this, a form of world making. The feminist eco eco punk I offer is not an aesthetic stand. It's first and foremost an ethical position on how to live in a media dirty world. The ecolalia sounding concept of eco eco punk riffs on variations of the science fiction genre that merge punk's irreverent aesthetic 
with a creative mobilization of cancelled futurity while providing it with a relevant cultural imprint. From the original punk, feminist eco-eco-punk inherits an adversarial relationship to consensus reality. From cyberpunk, it borrows a gritty dystopian view of the techno future in which one gets by by making do. Eco-eco-punk embraces the irreverent and self-sustaining spirit of punk, but it also reworks cyberpunk's sense of general alienation into a form of active and creative engagement with the world's decaying systems and infrastructures. In foregrounding the intertwined aspects of unfolding ecological economic disasters, eco-eco-punk deromanticizes the decay while giving the situation a political twist. It also multiplies punk's agency beyond the heroism of the singular male outcast savior. Eco-eco-punk involves acknowledging the complex ensemble of images, data, and infrastructures, yet refusing to hold any of it in our hand, mind, or eye as just an object of analysis. So another project that I conducted in this spirit, as long as, you know, alongside the, the film I showed you a clip from called Exit Man, another project is called Planetary Exhalation, and it involves a series of images. Um, and as part of this eco-eco-punk mode of working, I produce uh, not just text, but also images. And I call them in my work loser images in an attempt to challenge the dominant ways of planetary vision and planetary inhabitation. So the loser images figuration follows in the footsteps of Hito Steyl, whose kin notion of poor images described lossy digital images traversing the network personal computers of our globe. Their poverty referred to their low quality and low resolution as a result of their incessant replication on ever cheaper media. But it also pointed to the wider condition of cultural disjuncture with the impoverishment of many image producers and image subjects and Im uh, went hand in hand with the enrichment of those in control of digital infrastructures. My loser images are precisely such poor images of the world, serving as counterpoints to the glossy views of planet Earth. They are, in a way, a form of re photography, you could say, referring to kind of previous presentation, although the question I would raise with regard to this is whether all photography isn't a form of re-photography. Re there is something not quite right with these loser images, as both representations and captures. The worldview they present is out of sync. It's wobbly, smeary, somehow degraded. Yet these loser images are not just mine. The concept is primarily meant to serve as a viewing, structuring, and archiving device, allowing us to develop a counter visuality from what is already there. The feminist eco-eco-punk ethos that drives the production of such loser images has affinities with Polish philosopher Ewa Majewska's notion of the avant-garde of the weak, a mode of working which combines the feminist rejections of patriarchal visions of genius and creativity and emancipatory claims originating in the peripheries with their demand for an expanded epistemology one including marginalized and colonized territories. In the spirit of the avant-garde of the weak, my eco-eco-punk approach offers a possibility to overcome the individualism and performance of and spectatorship, and individualism of performance and spectatorship via a commonality of experiencing failure and weakness. I'm citing Majewska again. Or at least it aims to stage this failure and weakness as a shared experience. So for me, this is an attempt to approach environmental management beyond the logics of optimization and efficiency that characterize what Haraway called the informatics of domination with its macho desire to master, control, and conquer. In the media ecology of feminist eco-eco-punk, the hero's name is Legion, 
and they may not even be just human. This mode of practice opens up a traditional cyberpunk ethos to the plurality of voices, sensibilities, and sensations. The concept of eco-eco-punk encapsulates this very spirit of more than one, a community of confluences and contaminations that goes beyond the experience of a disaffected loner from outside the cultural mainstream, fighting totalitarian corporations with his wit and kit. Eco-eco-punk reverberates with the multiplicity of actors, human and non-human ones, who are at work in the system. The recognition of this plural and entangled ontology of our ecologies, which are always already media ecologies, is a first step towards outlining contours of an eco-eco-punk ethos which has progressive ramifications. Feminist eco-eco-punk recognizes not only the benefits of living with advanced technology, but also the fact that humans are originarily technical beings, that we have emerged and evolved with and via diverse objects and practices, such as plows, fire, wheels, agriculture, cooking, and transportation. A mode of breaking out of the echo chamber of the conventional responses to the Anthropocene that remain rooted in affects such as gloom and doom, eco-eco-punk sees the world as always already media dirty, embroiled, entangled, enmeshed. Yet dirt is not positioned here as something to be overcome for a civilization to take place and hold together. It's rather seen as our civilization's constitutive element. Dirt is also a reminder of the remainder and a conduit of mediation. Eco-eco-punk therefore becomes a mode of acting for those for whom ecology connects via wires and wirelessly to the media infrastructures that organize the world and that shape our position in it. Feminist eco-eco-punk speaks to those who would rather be cyborgs than goddesses and for whom art making and world making function as inevitable technical prostheses for a human embedded in the world and becoming with the world. So this is my proposal for how to manage the end of the world, envisaging and enacting a feminist counter apocalypse in multiple modes and media. It uses a variety of cultural techniques of thinking and making to work through the current infrastructural and conceptual impasses. You can see it as an ongoing performance of what I called in my worldly earlier work, a minimal ethics for the Anthropocene. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, so we have uh, a lot of questions here from our attendees and I think um, maybe we can try to synthesize some of the main points here. But you know, one thing that really um, emerges in hearing all these talks um, is this tension that we see around media infrastructures as either um, containing uh, our, the, the possibilities for our, our environmental prospects, um, for environmental management, and media infrastructure as potentially participating in this kind of um, uh, expansion. So this is speaking to Jeff, Jeffrey Winthrop Young's question here in the chat, um, where he talks about you know the metaphorical confinement um, versus this question of metaphorical release um, is. Uh, maybe to feed off Ed, he says, a meta is a metaphorical ignition necessary to conceptualize issues we did not see before. So I kind of want to pose that, um, I guess, tension first to uh, the panelists uh, in this panel and also the previous one, um, where you see those tensions between confinement and release um, in your own uh, works of media. And then we can kind of move on to some of the other questions as well. I can take a stab at that uh, if anyone else would like to go after me. Uh, so I, I agree. I think that one of the tensions I've seen throughout the talks is the ways in which so many of these media platforms and, and media infrastructure um, organize attention around certain models of consumption or you know, re reposting, reiteration, duplication of sometimes bad information. And uh, I think it's it's 
really important to ask that question of how do we um, create new metaphors or invite people to um, sort of uh, to, to, to become creative authors in different ways of, uh, of new kinds of stories about the environment, stories about the future. I bring this um, sort of narrative mindset to all of this because I think that um, it's really helpful to fall back on, on narratives. And it's, it's often, it's always a bad idea to ignore a narrative, even if you're not going to use it as your primary uh, mode of action. But, you know, we're storytelling animals. And uh, when we're talking about environmental uh, challenge, the climate crisis, we're talking about futures, we're talking about complex systems, stories are kind of the only good tool we have. We're really bad at the statistics. We're really bad at the math. We're really bad about, at, really bad at caring about large numbers of abstract people or, or animals or, or ecosystems. Um, but we're pretty good at holding stories in our heads and using them as microcosms of, of broader realities. So I think that attention to narratives and how we invite people to author and co-author and co-create new kinds of stories is really, really important. And most of the uh, platforms that we have, you know, have a, have a negativity bias because we pay more attention to bad news and they have, uh, you know, all of the all of the fraught, fraught problems of capitalism in terms of how they're organized in the sort of pyramid scheme models of information that they adopt. So I think that would be maybe a starting point to, to get into this question. Maybe if I can just add briefly, um, I think the humanities are, and, and both in their more kind of analytical guise and in the more creative guise coming from the arts can perhaps bring a different way of, lo of looking at these kinds of impasses. So Ed was talking about these stories, ways of using imagination. Maybe it's as little or as much as we can do. Uh, and it's probably one of the strengths of the humanities that we take on board that difficulty of living with the kind of uncertainty of the situation, but also working through that paralysis and the horror and you know what the human you know the, the kind of philosophy or literary theory used to call the sublime that almost impossibility of imagining the size and the sheer horror of the phenomenon that is be it climate change or some other kind of apocalyptic event that is awaiting us, but also working through that, working through that tension. And there's been a lot of work, more politically inclined work, through, you know, with the notion of precarity as in Anad Singh, or there are other kind of vocabularies and ways around it. And it's precisely not working through the logic of optimization and solutionism that I think the kind of more humanities thinking can kind of find ways of, of you know, opening, opening from within the strictures, strictures which are of course material and existential, on many different levels for many different universes and species, but also how to think ourselves not out of the of the crises, multiple crises, but also how to think through them. Thanks so much for that. Um, I, I think another thread that we can maybe pull on um, between all of our presentations is the question of temporality. Um, you know, so. Obviously, Joanna and Ed, you're both working with um, speculative media here. And, you know, if we think about infrastructure as creating structures of stability across both space and time, um, then that mediation across time is also significant. And, and Jake, you know, you're kind of um, interfacing this, with this question uh, through this compression of time, right, with read photography, um, as well as, you know, similarly to John Jonathan, um, the idea of of shock, you know, the role of shock and um, uh, exceptional ex crisis in structuring our imaginal, uh, uh, environmental imaginaries. So um, I'm going to kind of build off again uh, another question from the chat around the mediation of temporality. Um, is uh, so the the question in the chat is from Jeffrey again. Um, and it's for Gunesh specifically from the last panel. Um, are you considering questions of changing urban temporalities? And I mean, in an evolutionary context, that is cities as accelerators of nature um, in the sense that they speed up the evolution of incoming species. Uh, but I think we can also kind of connect that question to um, the other talks as well. Um, the extent to which um, you see a kind of changing uh, infrastructure for temporality as well in your works.
would anyone like to start? Maybe, uh, I guess Gunesh is, is no longer here, but um, would anyone like to tackle that uh, question? I'll, I'll take a quick shot, but I have to stop talking. Um, I think that infrastructures produce time. That's how we make time. That's how we invent time. And then they also manage time. Uh, and I was struck during Jacob's talk in the ways in which uh, photography becomes this machine for, for seeing temporal change and, and framing temporal change in a way that would not otherwise be humanly possible. Uh, and many of our systems do that. They sort of regulate and produce different kinds of temporal experiences. Bernard, I see that you had an interesting synthesis in the chat as well um, around this question of democratic imaginaries versus technocratic imaginaries. Um, did you want to elaborate that on a little bit? I think that's a nice uh, point for discussion here. Um, yeah, I'm going to try to just be very concise. I mean, it did seem as if there, there were... Uh, I probably phrase it better in the chat, but it seems to me like there are two strands of uh, analysis and presentation here, although I think actually Joanna synthesizes them to some extent, right, between attempts to uh, visualize and figure and imagine in a democratic way uh, environmental circumstances and this question of whether or not these, these representations are adequate versus another tendency, certainly on display, I think, I think in Lisa and Gunesh's work, which actually suggests a lot of the key mediations are taking place in a kind of technocratic expert domain. And the, and, you know, and it, it, it's, you know, I think it's a real open enduring question, whether or not those can be bridged uh, whether or not, and even even in a certain sense, uh, because of certain questions of how one makes a decision, if they if they should be totally bridged, I don't have a, a a claim so much as I felt a kind of wonderful tearing between these two places of producing and figuring environments that we're servicing in different ways across the talks. Can I can I kind of follow up and ask a question? And uh, it's. I was just thinking about um, I was thinking about in Jacob's presentation and the whole idea of you know how we think uh, and how we think ourselves out of the current moment and something I'm preoccupied with at the moment is the work of kind of Russell Herbert who is a psychologist at the University of uh, I think Nevada Las Vegas and he's talking about five different ways in which we think we think with words we think with images and then there are three other ways apparently which are much more messy and zigzaggy and they had to do with sensations and things like that so I wanted to pose a question to Jacob and maybe to others about that way of thinking with images about the current crisis of infrastructures. Um, and to what extent is that thinking with images actually a form of thinking? Do we really think with images? Do photographs visualize what we already think? Do these ideas um, that we have with regard to how we visualize, represent, understand, grasp what's going on, do they only occur to us through the seeing of images. So what is the relationship between thinking with images and other forms of thinking when it comes to dealing with the mess we're currently in? But as I say, it could be a question to, to Jacob, but it could be the question, a question to any, anyone else. Hi, I can jump back in now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll leave my video off because my internet's a bit spotty. Um, but yeah, that's a great, I think that's kind of the, the conundrum with, with images and trying to pin them down to a particular causal relationship with their effect on how people, yeah, because I think, I think that is the, the problem is that we take these images and we think that they have a particular effect on how people think and then how that thinking leads to action. Um, and that's why I'm interested in the idea of them as gestures of concern, because it does, they also change how you feel. Um, and all those kind of things are related and interrelated. Um, and obviously, when you take something like a landscape uh, that has particular material effects and connotations, um, and you kind of you frame it in a particular way, 
uh, and then circulate it. Um, and I think that's the before and after structure is it, it does kind of abstract it to a particular kind of thinking of, you know, have to think yourself out of the apathy or complacency, whatever state it is that you're trying to, the, re- the re-photographed image is trying to get someone from one state of thinking to another. And I think that's very, yeah, like you said, it's much more complex uh, than that. And I think that that can be one of the effects in the documentaries depict the effect that this has on particular people. And, you know, Richard Vevers is one of the conservationists in the documentary and he sees these images and it does change his way of thinking and being in the world in this very decisive way. But that's not always the case with everyone's encounter. Um, So I think expanding what these images can do um, that rhetorically or thinking about them in more rhetorically complex ways is, is necessary. Right. I think about Ed's point, you know, that Imagining Futures is also about empowering people or the empowerment, uh, empowering people to imagine futures in their own way, right? Um, um, So I'm going to move on to another question in the chat here from Hannah Tollefson. Um, I was wondering if the speakers or organizers could talk a little bit more about the concept of environmental management. How does environmental management relate to other forms of management like business administration and operations management? Are there particular logics, techniques, or histories that either overlap or diverge across these sites and forms of management? Um, and, and Hannah, I'll just uh, respond very quickly um, for my own present, my own side to say that, yeah, I've, I've been thinking a lot about the convergence here between environmental management and other um, infrastructures for management. I think there are um, a lot of shared uh, imaginaries and also administrative tendencies um, between these two different realms. Um, and, um, you know, especially when we think about things like planetary observation, those are tied, uh, especially to these legacies of imperial governance and management. Um, and so I think you can certainly see the ways in which, um, large scale environmental infrastructures are, are reproducing those frameworks. Um, but I'll also open that up, that question up to, uh, the other panelists as well, if anyone else wants to add. I'm just going to make one brief remark, which is that what I, what I, one thing that I think is interesting about the concept of environmental management uh, is, you know, it's, it's, it's explicit orientation towards basically producing a sphere and a space for life, right? I think you can certainly argue businesses about organizing, producing ways of life and so forth. And so, you know, the idea to make this reference towards cultural techniques that, you know, it's a method of culturing and technically producing a space is also, you know, it's it's also, I, I think there's a stake there that, you know, that needs, that could be brought out more about, you know, there's been lots of talk about Figuration and presentation and making things visible and experience, but you know, I th- I, th- I think it was um, I don't know if it was Jacob who just mentioned landscape. You know what I mean? And I I do think environmental management invites us to c- confront activities of figuration and production production and representation that are not exactly uh, symbols in the same way some other domains are. So I think it's a really interesting site to delve further into with a lot of wonderful little mysteries inside of it. Just, just on that um, point, I wanted to briefly mention Anna Singh's um, work on um, environmental management and sort of the point of uh, often environmental management um, as a sort of anti-politics machine um, to kind of convert um, different sorts of social and cultural issues into uh, questions of tech. tech technical uh, management but also I guess um, in the Amazonian context one thing that I find um, so fascinating with this as as, sort of, as as a site is there is a sort of huge amount of um, awareness of the kind of bifurcation of um, nature culture into the environmental the emergence of the environmental as such as something which is kind of um, also kind of colonially purified um, and which uh, is sort of discrete from um, um, many forms of landscaping, um, which have uh, which are said to be a, a kind of unfolding over millennia, and which is sort of deeply tied to what these, uh, you know, I think one of the phrases from um, that emerged in the material um, from um, from August uh, twenty nineteen was from an indigenous uh, community member who said um, the forests are the plants, the animals, and the people, 
and that's what forests are. We can't sort of somehow think of forests as in, in a way it was interesting with Macron is that sort of the, the sort of NASA um, thermal imaging uh, relation to the planetary kind of framing um, implies that the, I mean, it's in the phrase, the lungs of the earth, these are our lungs, which also provide a kind of carbon drawdown service, um, which is also resonates a lot with what's been happening around COP, uh, COP26 and the rise of nature-based solutions and the con deep controversies around nature-based solutions and what each of those uh, phrase is doing in terms of carving up nature culture and designating agency and um, aspirations um, in that way. So I think I agree it's it's an important thing to unpack, but also uh, maybe there are other forms of kind of na nature cultural um, coordination, if you want to call it that way, or um, sort of uh, coexistence um, to learn from, which have much longer histories than that phrase of management. Thanks for that, Jonathan. Um, I, I see a hand up in the audience from Alexandra Kelly. Alexandra, did you have a question that you'd like to ask live? If not, you're welcome to type that into the Q&A. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna move on to a question from Rolian uh, Hoying. I agree with Bernard and Joanna's summarizing comments and I would like to ask more about how to get away from smartness slash data and its link with the discourse of crisis. Um, and toward witnessing ecological richness, richness that requires some other way of dealing with data. Um, so following Gunesh, if transduction can lead to what Simon Don considers signification versus uh, reductive cybernetic signal, how would this help us imagine what could be the sound or voice, uh, to use a metaphor here, of ecological richness and its potential? Also, how would this line of inquiry resemble um, or differ from the parliament of things and it's a rethinking of democracy. One thing this makes me think of is um, speculative and sometimes real efforts to give uh, legal or formal voice to natural systems, uh, you know, lakes, rivers, uh, and other entities. Uh, Carl Schrader, among others, is, are speculative fiction writers who imagine futures where uh, machine learning and AI or other sorts of uh, te technological um, interventions uh, give power and give voice to different natural systems and essentially uh, function to, to, to participate in discussions, you know, deliberative conversations about what should be done in terms of environmental management. Um, and I think that there's something really interesting in that idea of, of what is the, if, if, if who who is going to speak for these these systems? And uh, connecting back to the last question, I've been thinking about one of our our fellows, uh, Vandana Singh, who writes a lot about um, local uh, local management or local kinds of and, and indigenous forms of um, relationships with forests and other natural systems. Um, and she has this beautiful vision of a, of a tapestry of hundreds thousands of local communities and activist groups and others who are. Um, taking on this role of management, but in a way that is not the top-down, you know, um, the sort of colonial approach, but but maybe a better word would be, I think she, she uh, the, the, uh, something like the symbiosis. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I think that's very interesting in this context, uh, identifying what the sort of collaborative assemblages are of, of people and ecosystems and, and, uh, uh, and other, other entities that might speak for these different perspectives. And simply having someone there, there's interesting research on how important it is simply to have someone speaking for the future or speaking for these different perspectives as the you know, deliberations go on, to, because it's, we're, just, we're, we're bad at remembering things that are not, that are outside of our own little sphere. We're bad at remembering uh, uh, to, to look out for you know, <laughs> the earth. And so structuring that in, I think is, is really, really important. And for me, some of, uh, I think an important issue as well is something we could describe as returning to the human after the post-humanist critique. Because, uh, for example, I'm a little suspicious about all these ideas about the parliament of things and the kind of the flat ontological networks, because 
to a large extent, it's still the human who is conducting the expansion or who is giving a particular name and political infrastructure uh, to something that that human identifies with their own visual and cognitive apparatus as a particular organization of the world. And then the human enlarges that organization and allows other beings a role and place in it. Maybe the other beings want to be arranged into a completely different schema rather than a parliament or anything else. So, and also maybe they don't want to function as part of that kind of uh, entity. So while, you know, to respond to the question, I am very much interested in finding ways of working through the crisis. And I'm suspicious of, you know, some uh, theorists, academics, artists using the crisis as well as a certain fuel for our own human narcissism at the pleasure of wallowing in the crisis, which seems to fuel an infinite number of exhibitions, publications, and things like that. At the same time, of course, I think a lot of us are thinking about the, the mess we are in and because obviously we, because we are concerned. I mean, it's a, it's a certain form of concern about the conditions of life for different beings and entities of which, you know, humans are only a sliver of that. So that concern, how do we deal with this without, on the one hand, falling into the narcissism trap, on the other hand, still uh, kind of running the back program of human aggrandizement, which very magnanimously expands the, uh, the kind of participa participation to other beings, other entities, without really resigning from their own role of the declarer of value, of the expounder of forms of life? And how do we cut the human to size, if you like, in a meaningful way that still allows us to, you know, concern ourselves with our own little human cognitive anxieties that, you know, drive us and also drive us to extinction and, distra and distraction and detraction? Uh, but on the other hand, how do we actually, you know, recognize that other beings, other entities have completely different ways of organizing uh, what we humans call the universe? And that might be a very different and often incompatible ways of, of organizing that. And obviously what is seen that amongst humans, I mean, there's a lot of different humans have completely different ways of organizing the universe. Uh, so with that kind of larger expansion of entities, beings, uh, animate and non-animate ones, we get into a whole kind of different, uh, I can't, I don't even know if we can speak about one ontology here. I'm sorry, and I'm just starting to ramble now. But basically, the answer the answer is, yes, let's work through the crisis. Let's not dwell on it. Uh, and how do we dwell in it in an ethical way that also cuts us to size, including our own desire to kind of aggrandize ourselves through that moment of mourning? Could we find another effective register and could we also resign from a certain ex concept conceptual expansionism? That's probably my two cents. Joanna, that resonates so strongly with, with so much of what I've been thinking about around um, these medical imaginaries that very much seem to be like a transhumanist extrapolation, right, of, mm -hmm. um, of uh, very human situated ideas of care uh, onto our environment. And, um, you know, I think the, meta the medical metaphor that I've sort of been thinking through is, is the idea of like an intubated environment. Um, there's a kind of uh, relation of um, uh, inequality and, and of dependency that's sort of being created through these kinds of infrastructures precisely because of um, that tendency, I think, to uh, to excise the possibilities for <laughs> irreverence, right? Non-human irreverence as well. Um, so I'm looking at the clock and it looks like um, we are a little bit over time. So we're gonna go ahead and um, close this discussion for now. Um, but I, I wanna thank all of the attendees for coming today. Um, this has been a, a really rich discussion and, and I hope you all got something out of it. And please feel free to um, follow up with any of us uh, if you have further questions over email. Um, and so thank you very much.